for this review, we're going over a um, one, of, one of the paleontology books that I have here. A uh, book written by Jack Horner, famous paleontologist, um, who works in Montana in Hell Creek Formations near Bones, Montana. Also teaches at the, I think, the University of Montana, um, um, University of Montana there. Uh, this is his third book here, along with, um, and he's written it with James Gorman, How to Build a Dinosaur, uh, published by um, Dutton Books. This was, um, I got this back in 2009, I just now got to reading it. I have a whole list of books um, that I had to get to, you know, like that, but the, um, this is a third book after his, um, the first one he did was Digging Dinosaurs. Uh, this is, talks about his um, uh, field work in, in Montana where he found a famous nesting colony of myosaurs. And it gave it a lot of, um, cleared up a lot of questions that, you know, about uh, dinosaur behavior, so um, how, they are, how they interact socially. His follow-up book about more research involving that, Dinosaur Lives, continuing um, his research into that and what all he's found. But this one is a slightly different direction. Um, how to build dinosaurs in reference to um, how to um, get a dinosaur back from a chicken. Oh, let me let me explain that thorough. That wasn't very good. But the idea is is that since birds are direct descendant of dinosaurs, particularly theropod dinosaurs, it the um you could probably reverse evolution, so to speak, by expressing those traits that's still in the genome, where normally it's um shut down or um or parts of it of the genome shut down to where it produces chicken. You could go back and and look at you know through the embryo and find out which hormones, which proteins, and which um, other biochemicals to reproduce the traits um, that are that the, they used to have in the ancestry. Particularly, fully developed arms with three separate fingers, an elongated tail, um, as as you've seen in the slideshow, but also in the back of this book, what he's sort of getting at. The Chickenosaurus, right here, and it's saying all this is in the genome itself, so they're not adding or you know they're not adding anything to it, but they're looking for what, um, what what chemicals at what the right timing to express those traits, you know, into a chicken that it already has in it. The book itself is starting, you know, starts off um, from the field out where he works to the laboratory where the research is be done for the Chickenosaurus, as it's called. Um, from Hell Creek, which is where um, Jack Horner does a lot of his work, he they, he talks about the T Rex that he found that was unfortunately so heavy they had to break it in half, and uh, which he didn't want to do, but he has to be done. But in doing so, gave him some interesting research in areas that they didn't uh, didn't go to before, because this time, um, you know, they look at the bone histology. Were, um, and they found out it was a female because of that motor layer bone, which is a type of bone layer that's quickly laid out in order to provide the, um, you know, minerals for the eggs that's going to be later on. So they knew it was a female. And also through the work of Mary Schweitzer, who found these soft tissues um, that uh, and remnants of, of red blood cells, not directly red blood cells and all that. And they talk about um, all the work you know, on that and how to, you know, Try to be scientists about it. If you read carefully in this book, they don't just do what news articles do and say, "Oh, they they found dinosaur you know DNA and stuff like that." No, um, it, it you know it's it had to be much more subtle. They had to be skeptical of their findings and everything, and they also try to support their claim. You know they, okay, so this this could be you know like the same you know it could be soft tissue. So they tried to disprove that it isn't. They go through multiple different experience experiments with that, um, and then. Um, so and then this kind of leads to the idea of a, another scientist who's going to and look at the embryology of chickens and, <clears throat> you know, try and see, okay, since chickens are directly related to theropods, then you can express the traits they used to have, you know, sort of the ad, you know, ativism, says, to speak. So what you can do is, uh, okay, if you knew at this time this um, um, chemical was introduced and they say it gave them more tail vertebrae, and then you find you know and find a way to keep that going instead of being reduced like it normally would. Unfortunately, you know, at the time this book was written, not too much research was done on the tail lengthening of a of chicken embryos. It done a lot of research on a limb development, but not so much on tail. So they have to do more research on that. And the difficulty of this is even more so. It's kind of like a complicated symphony, to where 
chemicals you know in the organism are produced at a certain time triggering these reactions producing other chemicals and when the production of those chemicals stop previous ones at different times so they have to find out what does what at what time and hopefully um, produce an embryo that will express these traits and, okay if you're thinking about the old you know the classic science fiction of messing with the DNA and introducing that back out it's pretty much certain that if this animal ever by chance lived and got out and reproduced, it would just produce chickens. Because everything about expression is artificially done, the rest of the DNA still functions the same as normal. But more details will be that can be brought about this. So, um, Jack Horner was one of those um, paleontologists that when you grew up in the 80s and 90s, especially after 90s um, with the Dinomania due to Jurassic Park, you know, he was on lots of different documentaries. So you knew about him very well. He was a superstar among paleontologists. And I definitely admire his work. And I'm going to bring up this antidote here where I got to, um, last year at Sam Milton Museum, Jack Horner gave a lecture there. Not about Chickenosaurus, although he was mentioned here. Part of the process, even though this was done by 2009, I don't know if they made too much headway because of limited funding. It's going to take a lot of, you know, funding to get through, you know, to do this. I don't know how much has happened since 2009 up to 2016. Hopefully some headway. But, um, all that aside, he, um, he came by to Sam Noble, gave a lecture about dinosaur accoutrements. In other words, headgear, like spikes, frills, um, the, um, head crest of, of, of um, ornithopods, duck dinosaurs, and all that. He talked about what their purposes was, and after the lecture there, but long story short, um, mating displays. You know, for instance, Ceratopsian horns, we are taught as children, some people may still believe this, that they're meant for defense, and this may, this would make sense at first, looking upon like Triceratops with the horns sticking out, but if you look at most Ceratopsians, they have horns kind of going all over the place, you know, gone to sides, you know, tip downward, and... Horner says that most, the better defensive weapons is on the tail. You know, you put it on the tail, they seem to, you know, it seems to be much more effective to any chylosaurs with their clubs or spike tails. Stegosaurs are, are, are examples. And, you know, put a, even if a Triceratops uses its horns to stab a T-Rex in the gut, well, a T-Rex, if it's killed, it's going to fall forward and land on it. Not very good um, attack weaponry. So, and not to mention the frill of Ceratopsians, Classically, you've been, you know, we've all been told that, oh, would it be service protection? Because you look at a Triceratops, it's a big, solid, bony frill. The only thing is, most, a lot of Ceratopsians, I don't know about most, but a lot of them don't have that thick of a frill that will serve as that added protection, especially on that one spot just behind its neck. Some parts of the frill are very, very thin. So, not much protection. However, it can, they are very porous with a lot of blood vessels going through. So, you know, and you put a keratin um, layer on top of that. Oh, also another thing about the horns, a lot of them are hollow from his finding in the fossil record. So not very good weapons right there. But going back, so these frills and horns were meant as um, mating displays. Now, I agree with all that he presented. You know, he, he had good points of them all. But then one question came out. I was, I was wanting to ask him a question about um, thermoregulation. But someone in the audience was, you know, got to got to it first, so I didn't mind that. And he he didn't quite buy the thermoregulation. You know, he um, you know, some of the idea the idea that some of these parts like the ceratopsians um, would have these um, frills to help regulate um, heat, you know, help get rid of it as, you know, similar to elephant ears. He didn't think there was strong evidence to support that, but later on, after that lecture, and another day of class, I was taking vertebrate paleontology at the time, I was speaking to the professor along with the, another student, we were talking about that, and we kind of hit the points. It's like, first of all, even if that's not the main point of the frill for thermoregulation, it's a consequence of it because you have a huge bulky animal, and assuming it's warm-blooded, it's, um, you know, it's going to produce a lot of heat through the bulk of its body, which being large, you don't want, you know, the problem, problem with being warm-blooded is that you don't want to get big. Because the bigger you get, 
the less surface area you have to radiate that excess heat, which could cause you know damage to the body, particularly brain and stuff like that. So you need to find a way to get rid of that you know excess heat you're producing there. But and so elephants can do this because of the large ears. Yeah, they can hear very well, but the huge ears that they have radiate a lot of heat from its body. Things like lions and all that spend a good majority of their time when not hunting at rest, panting. That's a way to get rid of heat. So if you're a ceratopsian, which is nearly, you know, triceratops owns almost the size of an elephant. You know, it's if it's warm blooded, it's got to radiate the heat, and that frill is very thin, especially with, you know, according to Horner, has all that blood going through it. Yeah, it can produce coloration, but also can, you know, by consequence of being thin and, you know, and flat, it would produce radiate a good chunk of that heat in comparison to the bulk of its body. So, yeah, you can have a disagreement to even a guy you admire throughout all these years. So, but that's that's science for you. You can, you know, you make these, you know, you do the research, you, you know, make a claim, you try to support it, and um, try to counter, um, you know, any counter arguments. Or if they do bring something up that, you know, you don't have an answer for, that's where you do more research, something you look into. So you try to keep building the body of knowledge till you find out what is the most likely answer, if not the answer. But at least with that lecture, I can say um, I did get his autograph. So <laughs> that was a good thing too. I didn't do it on this book, which I had at the time because I didn't read it yet. And I kind of feel I felt kind of weird of uh, having him sign a book I haven't read yet. He did ask me that though. Um, the funny thing was when I was waiting in line getting an autograph before his lecture there, there was a guy behind me, nice enough guy, but he kind of believed that um, the Earth, he believed in expanding Earth theory because he read from some guy who believed that um, certain arrays from the sun um, co go into the Earth and causes it to expand. I didn't want to argue with that because, um, you know, he was wondering why this guy didn't take the, you know, take the main scene physicist to, you know, uh, replace, um, Oh, oh, um, Stephen Hawking's and all that, and well, can't win them all, you know. But that's that's another issue entirely. But the thing is, you know, um, yes, to build a dinosaur, very good book. Um, I again, as I'm recording this, I don't know how far the research has gone, but maybe you can look in that to yourself. But it's a very quick read, relatively about only uh, over a little slightly over a couple hundred pages, and it's a nice good um, structure from out in the field into the laboratory where. Um, this cross-disciplinary um, of sciences from paleontology to microbiology and seeing the connection that between dinosaurs and birds and hopefully with this they might be able to do a chicken with the atavisms of the claws and tail that its ancestors used to have. So give it a go. Um, to build How to Build a Dinosaur by Jack Horner and James Gorman. Um, thank you all for watching. Y'all have a nice day.